Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome here at America House. I'm really looking forward to this event. Uh, while on the main stage at Bayerischer Hof, uh, there's a debate of the what Christoph Heusken called the German-French couple, uh, Olaf Scholz and Emmanuel Macron, uh, talking about the conventional weapons, delivering the leopards to Ukraine, we will have a very innovative but also very important topic here on stage. So thank you very much, um, Junge DGAP, for organizing this event, and welcome um, to the event debating the West response to digital information warfare, a call to action in a polarized world. Information warfare in a polarized world, um, a very important topic. I'm really looking forward to the speakers. And I have to admit that on my list, I do not have as many people as there are chairs, so I think that we will have additional speakers, but I'm sure that you will tell us who they are. The ones on my list, which I would like to especially welcome, are Jürgen Ehle, Rear Admiral at German Armed Forces, Senior Military Advisor. Welcome. Mr. Radoslav Sikorski. Yeah, yes, of course. Radoslav Sikorski, Member of European Parliament, former Secretary of State and Minister of Defense, Republic of Poland. Welcome. And because we are also very much focusing on the intergenerational um, and um, all kinds of diverse um, panels here, I'm really looking forward to also hear Dr. Katja Munoz, DGAP Research Fellow, Center for Geopolitics, Geoeconomics and Technology. Welcome. And Manuela Kasper Klarich, editor in chief at Deutsche Welle. So, those are the four people on my list. Welcome. And I'm sure that you will be told in a second who all the others are. And I know that we also have very distinguished guests in the audience. We also welcome those, some of them rather older generation, I think, but a warm welcome to you as well. And I'm really looking forward to the event. Thank you. Okay. All right. Wow. Cool. So thank you, first of all, uh, Mike Zwingberger, for this uh, great introduction. So uh, congratulations for you hosting the Youth Hub also this year again. Um, you're not only having a great program all over the year with cultural ex uh, exhibitions and political debates and really a lot going on, and you are already an enrichment for Munich and far beyond Munich. So thank you very much for hosting us, but also thanking very much for all the preparations, uh, all the teams that are acting behind the stage, uh, Mr. Faltermeyer and all the other persons. So thank you for hosting us. It's a great pleasure, and um, thanks for the collaboration. Thank you. Okay, now to the book protocol. So, excellencies, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, family and friends of DGAP, I'm very pleased to have also our president here, Mr. Tom Enders, and our CEO and director, Guntram Wolf. Thank you very much for coming. It's a <laughs> privilege. And also, of course, uh, welcome to all the guests here in the room in the America House in Munich, but also the hundreds of people that we have on our YouTube live broadcast. So very uh, happy to welcome you to the German Council on Foreign Relations. Well, today we have an interactive debate. All of you will be part of this debate. You have signed up for a voting debate on the notion, as you can read it here, information warfare, a promising approach for Western states, to protect their interests in the era of digital indoctrination. Quite a, wake, um, quite a wake notion to vote on, but as the topic is quite difficult, as we will see, and as there's really a lot of perspectives on the topic, um, we will vote and then debate and then vote. We will hear in a minute how we're going to do this event. I will not do a big introduction to the topic, but there's three things that are very important to us. First of all, it's not only authoritarian actors that go into information warfare, and information warfare is nothing new. If we look back into the Cold War, we have seen information warfare going on for multiple decades, so we do not want to have a blame game of only these states are doing it and we don't. Secondly, it's important to say that we have really thought about using the term warfare, which is everything else but something beautiful, 
but we think that we have actors, we have strategies, we have goals and we have means, so we like to take the word warfare to have a structure for thinking about this problem, because after all, information warfare often proceeds or uh, safeguards also physical military warfare. And the last, um, the last thing that I want to convey before we're going to introduce the speakers is that we want to ask different kinds of questions. We don't only want to answer the notion, but we want to ask what is going on, what can we do about it, so what are our capabilities um, to, to challenge uh, information warfare and to defend against, defend against it. We also want to ask a normative question, should the West engage in information warfare? What instruments could we really do as a liberal democracy? And finally, the philosophical question, what would other actors think of us? Do we also conduct information warfare, or are we all playing safe? So with these four kinds of questions, I would like to introduce uh, the panel once again. But uh, as Ms. Zwingenberg has already said, I am not alone tonight, and there's one more chair than me plus the other four speakers. Um, while the first part of our event shall be a quite good debate, it, it, I hope it's not going to be, um, there's not going to be all too equal um, opinions. The second part should be a conversation where we have all of you here, but also from the digital questions that you can all convey to us and have a, uh, have a conversation together. And therefore, I would like to uh, also warmly welcome Jennifer Pano. She is a long-standing member of uh, DGAP. She was actually the chairwoman of the Junge DGAP a couple of years ago, so she's kind of my uh, predecessor in, in this job. And also, she is working as partner for Agora Strategy Group. It's a geopolitical advisory company. So, warm welcome to Jennifer. Much Maximilian, and uh, I will jump uh, right into introducing our distinguished guests we will um, have on the panel today. And I'm, um, yeah, uh, very lucky that we have the chance to set up um, um, such an interesting um, panel with multiple perspectives from the military, from policy making, from journalism, uh, and academia and uh, think tank landscape. And uh, so, first of all, uh, I would like to welcome um, Admiral Ehle. Um, Admir Rear Admiral Jürgen Ehle serves as, um, at the German Armed Forces and a senior military advisor to the managing director, Common Security and Defense Policy, CD, uh, CSDP, at the European External Action Service. Um, please let's give a warm welcome to Admiral Ehle. And uh, you can already uh, join us here on, uh, on stage, please. Uh, yes, and amongst others, uh, Admiral Ehle has served as uh, Chief of Staff at the German Military Representative in the Military Committee of NATO and the EU, and uh, as well, um, he was head of the Military Policy Department at the Permanent Representation of the Federal Republic of Germany to the European Union and uh, with uh, the European External Action Service. He has developed the EU's uh, strategic compass, an ambitious plan of action for strengthening the EU's security and defense policy by uh, 2030, on which he certainly will touch on. And um, furthermore, he recent, his recent publication with uh, the EIS was the Foreign Information Manipulation, Interference and Cyber Security Threat Landscape. Um, and that one was published recently in December. So uh, again, welcome, and it's a great pleasure to have you here with us. And um, from Warsaw, we, Poland, we are glad to welcome His Excellency, the former Minister of the Republic of Poland, uh, Radoslaw Sikorski, and uh, very glad to have you here with us. <laughs> Let me say a warm welcome. Um, Radoslaw Sikorski is a member of the European Parliament and former, state, uh, former Secretary of State and Minister of Defense of the Republic um, of Poland. He has been calling for greater transparency and accountability in the digital media landscape. And in this regard, also for greater cooperation among um, EU member states to address these threats. 
Um, Rauslav Sikorsky is a vocal critic of Russian disinformation efforts, uh, particularly in the context of the ongoing war in Ukraine. Um, he argued that uh, the spread of false information by Russian state media and other actors has played a significant role in shaping public opinion and uh, fueling the conflict. Um, thank you for honoring uh, us with uh, your uh, visit today, Your Excellency, and a warm welcome to Munich. And from Berlin and London, we are welcoming uh, Manuela Kaspar Klerich, uh, editor in chief at Deutsche Welle. <laughs> Very glad to have you with us today. And, uh, Deutsche Welle defines uh, one of its uh, USPs in that uh, reporting on a one-sided way, but allowing different voices to have their say and uh, taking its time for fact-checking. Um, these fact-checking formats are increasingly requested by users. Um, diversity is the focal point of uh, Manuel Caspar Claret's editorship. Thus, uh, she created an advisory council of colleagues from different backgrounds uh, to help her gain wide-ranging insight from across uh, Deutsche Welle. And uh, so um, um, she also has a very absolutely positive slogan, one who smiles rather than rages is always the stronger. <laughs> so and in that sense, um, please again welcome with us Maria Kasper Claris to the discussion. And from Berlin, we welcome Dr. Katja Munoz. Uh, we're glad to have you with us here. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Katja Munoz is our in-house think tank expert on uh, geotechnological advances and works for our Center of Geopolitics, Geoeconomics and uh, Technology at the DJAP. Her expertise covers uh, disinformation, technology and geopolitics, digital policy and platform regulation. Um, and early warning systems and predictive intelligence. And uh, recently, Dr. Kanya, Katia Munoz uh, published a memo on how to plan and execute a coup. And uh, thus, we are very much looking forward to learn how social media <laughs> gives insurgents advantage. So welcome, Dr. Kanya, Katia Munoz, and it's also um, great to have you with us. So... Um, <laughs> And that being said, um, so um, I would like to ask you, all of you, for a short uh, impulse statement uh, on the topic and on the notion and say um, whether you are, um, and what, sorry? So we, I think it's best to start with yeah. the voting round because yeah, if we exactly. vote first, then yeah. we can see all of what the people think before your glorious statements come into play and you shape, <laughs> hopefully, and swing the room. <laughs> Thank um, you very much, Maximilian. No, don't worry, that's okay, <laughs> that's okay. So uh, a couple of us already have mm -hmm. debated on such mm -hmm. formats. Mr. Sikorsky has uh, debated last year and switched the room against John Mersheimer on the Ukraine conflict. And actually, we have this format uh, stolen from the, your discussion, so great that you are here. I would start with the voting, and uh, the voting um, is something that you can all participate in. So we have a tool called Slido. You can use either the barcode, which you will see in a second, or you can use slido.com and enter the hashtag MSCDJAP. And then you can vote on two questions that we have prepared, which you will always see in a, in a second. The first question is our notion. Um, please note that there is this before the debate on it, so you can later you will get the question again and don't get confused with the wrong, with the wrong question where we want to ask you whether you find it is a legitimate and a successful instrument to use information warfare. And then there's also a second question, and this question basically says, depending on what the panelists are telling you today, are you willing to change your opinion if you, th if you find your opinion is false? I hope we will get a very high percentage on the second question. Um, <laughs> would be a pleasure. Don't lead them on. <laughs> so we already see live how this, uh, how this first question is answered. So we are about 75% for yes and 25% for no. Um, and I think that this will be relatively stable. We already have 65 votes in, and we will allow it for another 30 seconds. But what's interesting is that usually in these debates you have pro and con speakers, and we have not uh, invited you with a clear statement of being pro or con the notion. So we will be very interested in 
how our distinguished panelists are going to position themselves in what is information warfare, actually, because we have not provided you an, a definition so far. Um, so now we are close to 100, so I think statistically speaking, this is quite robust. And we are already having about 70 plus percent who are for the notion. Um, so with that, I would go to the second question. Um, you can still vote and you can still change your opinion during the debate with this question, if you like. And the second one, <coughs> we have 100%, great. That was a good check question. So there's <laughs> no bots involved. There's no uh, interference here in this election. Wonderful. Ah, almost. Okay, thank you. <laughs> good, but 90% plus is really good. So thank you very much for participating. And after the debate, we will have another voting round. So I want to have, hand over to Jennifer. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So um, this information by um, foreign actors is not a new phenomenon. Um, we've seen it also in the past um, under the um, word of uh, propaganda, but uh, now new impetus by um, new technology, technological advances and achievements and uh, um, and also new technologies we see rising from um, artificial intelligence, um, social media. Um, everyone can uh, more or less uh, yeah, give their statements in social media. And uh, so there are significant possibilities to increase the reach of such activity, as well as the combination uh, of new and diverse uh, tactics, techniques, and uh, procedures that are used across domains. Um, and therefore, my first question uh, goes out to Admiral Ehle. Um, so in the recent uh, report, which we, which we were just uh, mentioning, um, which you uh, were writing on together with um, the European External Action Service, um, the importance of information sharing and the sharing of best practices between um, the cybersecurity and uh, disinformation communities is highlighted. Um, therefore, the question is, uh, how can a better cooperation among EU institutions and bodies at policy level be achieved to enhance and facilitate these challenges we are facing here? Uh, and with that, I would also like to um, uh, open the discussion, giving you the word for your first um, um, keynote. That yeah, thank you, thank you so much. And first of all, uh, I would like to thank the Junge DGRP for inviting me to this panel. And I'm very pleased to, to see so many uh, young people here interested uh, in security and defense. And this is really amazing. Let me start with our proud uh, strategic document uh, with the strategic compass. As you may know, end of March uh, 2022, the EU, better to say the heads of state and government, adopted our strategic document, strategic compass, to make a quantum leap forward and take more responsibility for our security and defense. And the compass is setting out four work strengths. Act more quickly and decisively against fast-changing threats. Invest in the capabilities and technologies we need. Partner with others to achieve common goals and secure our citizens against fast-changing threats. And this secure chapter deals with hybrid threats, cyber diplomacy, and foreign information manipulation and interference. And the aim is to substantially enhance our resilience and ability to counter hybrid threats, cyber attacks, and foreign information manipulation and interference. Allow me now, in the next uh, six, seven minutes, to describe the challenges we face and what actions we in the European Union are taking against what you call information warfare. In, uh, intentional attempts to manipulate the information environment and public discourse by foreign actors is by no means, as you already pointed out in your introduction, a new phenomenon. However, these activities have received a considerable new impetus by technological advancements and propagation of the internet, in particular social media and private messenger services. It is not just about the spread of false and misleading information. Foreign actors seek to intimidate and harass independent and critical voices to reduce plurality of opinion and information. They manipulate online platforms to make their voice louder than anyone else. They use manipulative tactics such as bots 
fake websites, artificial amplification, and other methods to distort discussions and the information environment. Let me quote my boss, High Representative Joseph Borrell. He said, the Kremlin created a powerful manipulation industry to prevent people from understanding what is happening and to shift the blame. Russia's use of information manipulation and interference in the preparation and execution of its war of aggression against Ukraine demonstrates this and shows how such activity constitutes an integral part of modern warfare. The first ever ex um, um, European External Action Service report on FIMI threats, published just recently on 7th of February, shows us a wide variety of tactics and of information manipulation and interference applied by Russia, and by the way, also by China, in the last months of 2022. The threat is constantly evolving, and we have seen that it can target any policy area, be it climate change, migration, the international rules-based order, and our democratic systems and electoral processes as such. In addition, it is not only about one actor deploying specific narratives. While Russia is our biggest concern at the moment in light of its invasion of Ukraine, we see also other actors, such as China, engaging in suppression of independent and critical voices as a fundamental part of its strategy to manipulate the information environment and threaten freedom of expression and media freedom. We have stepped up in the European Union our efforts to expose what the Kremlin is doing and strengthened our proactive communication, including in Russian and Ukrainian and also in EU major languages. Our public channels, you may have heard of it, it's called EU versus Desinfo, disinformation, continue to raise awareness about pro-Kremlin information manipulation and interference and to expose its coordinated nature. Last year, EU versus Disinfo reached over 2.7 million people via their website and millions more via their social media channels. As the European Union, we have taken a range of unprecedented steps, such as sanctioning a number of Putin's instruments of war propaganda, as well as prominent individuals responsible for spreading disinformation, to respond decisively and with one voice. And because of the global scale of the challenge, the EU is also working together with international partners, such as the G7 and NATO, but also with civil society, academia, media and the private sector, in particular online platforms, to tackle this threat. And we have invested a considerable amount of effort in consulting our international partners. We are a member of the G7 Rapid Response Mechanism and other international fora aimed at tackling foreign information manipulation and interference. In the context of Ukraine, China, as I mentioned, has been spreading and amplifying disinformation narratives also used by Russia on Ukraine. For instance, US military biolabs, presence of neo-Nazi in Ukraine, accusing the West for the food and energy crisis. And a majority of Ukrainian-related reports in Chinese stated controlled media's international channels are based on pro-Kremlin and Russian official sources, giving a platform to Russian positions international, internationally, including where Russian media channels have been sanctioned. FIMI presents a dual challenge, internal in the sense of protecting the EU's and its member states' democratic processes and security, and external about working with like-minded partner countries to either support them in their work against FIMI or in working together to address an issue that goes beyond national borders, particularly in conflict-prone areas. Information manipulation thrived in the context of COVID-19 as a global pandemic provided fertile ground for hostile state actors acting directly or through proxies to manipulate the information environment. These actors exploited existing fears and insecurities of the population, including uneven social and economic impact through manipulative behavior to undermine the credibility of democratic governments and further polarize democratic societies. Let me finish by 
mentioning you some actions we are currently taking against all the threats. The EES, in close cooperation with the Commission, is working on developing the EU FEMI toolbox, which will be multifaceted with preventive, cooperative and stability building measures with the aim to lower the impact and deter actors from using FEMI. A closer cooperation between the European Union member states, civil society and the private sector will be central. And it will be built around four axes. Situational awareness, resilience, disruption and regulatory responsibility and diplomatic responsibility and instruments in the CFSP, that means Common Foreign, Common Foreign and Security Policy area. Back to the strategic compass I started with. The compass has highlighted that foreign information manipulation and interference is not only a threat to society and democracy, but also to our all security. This has been brought to stark daylight during Russia's full-scale invasion. The High Representative Josef Borrell on 7th February at the EES-hosted conference, which was called Beyond Disinformation, announced the Information Sharing and Analysis Center, which will facilitate the creation of a dedicated data space announced in the strategic compass. We in the European Union and we in the European Union External Action Service also working to support uh, CSDP missions and operations. We have currently uh, 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 seven uh, uh, military missions going on and 12 civilian missions to respond to FEMI that our men and women in theater are often the first ones which experience this kind of disinformation. And by equipping them with, a special, with special resources and also with uh, the right capabilities, we ensure that they are in an even better position to respond to FEMI and communicate about their work. And let me now, uh, from my, if I might, if I'm allowed to take part in the vote, I would say the first question: uh, Yes, I think we contribute and we intend to massively contribute to make the Western world more secure uh, in fighting disinformation and all the threats we face in this area. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Admiral Ele. And um, yeah, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Sikorsky, do you also agree? And uh, also as, um, yeah, as member of the European Parliament, but also as former um, Secretary of um, State and also as former uh, Defense uh, Minister of the Republic of Poland, um, you've been dealing um, with um, misinformation for a long time already. So that has also been uh, one of your focus areas. Um, do you see any progress? here and also when uh, Admiral Ehle mentioned that um, the civil society and also um, public and um, private sector should work more closely together. Um, where do you see the status quo and um, what do you think, where should we move um, towards to? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, thank you, Tom, for uh, uh, being the uh, patron of uh, such an excellent initiative. You have a real captain of industry here. Who is, um, uh, who is doing this, uh, this uh, excellent role. And, um, and I want to tell you that I've been on the receiving end of real digital warfare. Two years before Hillary Clinton and her staff were targeted by the Russian group Fancy Bears with their fist, uh, fisting operation, I received the same emails, I just didn't click. I passed them on to our, um, <laughs> to our um, uh, security services. Uh, but the, what the Russians discovered is that to uh, destabilize a politician, you don't actually need to show that he's doing anything wrong. All you need to show is the difference in the tone of communication that we use privately with colleagues and what we say publicly. And it's always different. Ooh, hypocrisy, and that's enough. Mm -hmm. But to arrive at my view on the motion, I, I would first um, like to um, disaggregate it. So first of all, what are the interests of Western states? Because they're very different from uh, the interests of some non-Western states. I would say at the highest level of generality, 
um, we are status quo powers. We just want to be left alone, and we want to maintain our standard of living. We don't seek to occupy other people's land. No. Right? Well, that's very different from the approach of either Russia or China. These are revisionist powers who are not happy with what they have. Russia is fighting to uh, uh, reconquer what they perceive as a renegade province. And China has an official policy of uh, taking back Taiwan. Mm. And, and by a certain date, mm. too. By the 100th anniversary of the uh, foundation of, of People's Republic. Um, and now, information is different from information warfare. In war, we use all means in, at our disposal, including falsehood. Mm. I mean, it's... You know, there's an old saying, the first victim of war is truth, right? Yeah. So, in wartime, it's legitimate, but it's not legitimate in peacetime. Um, and we are in a kind of confrontation, proxy con confrontation with Russia. Uh, and Russia is certainly flooding our information space with uh, all kinds of stuff. Russian, Russia was active during the Brexit campaign, it was active during the American campaign, uh, it was active in Poland, uh, 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 all over Europe, including in Germany. Uh, Russian media outlets were very successful in targeting uh, your community that uh, uh, immigrated into Germany from the former Soviet Union. And these are a few million people. Mm -hmm. And I'm told that many of them watch Russian uh, outlets and then they vote AFD in greater proportion than the general uh, population. I, I believe Germany should pay more attention to this. Mm -hmm. um, and so my answer will be that we have to, we, we shouldn't be naive. You know, for, too, for far too long, Putin was at war with us, but we were not taking it in. We were not accepting the challenge. We thought he was just a nuisance. And the things that he was saying about the West and about Ukraine were too crazy for him to mean it. Well, he did mean it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when it comes to a country which is attacking our periphery, our neighborhood, our political system, I think it's legitimate. But it shouldn't be our default uh, way of uh, uh, operating because it carries costs. Mm -hmm. Because once you lose these techniques, you are in great danger of losing credibility. Think Americans going to war in Iraq. The intelligence was fault, faulty. The US Secretary of State presented it at the UN Security Council. And it's only now, with the successful and truthful intelligence about what the Russians were going to do in Ukraine and what kind of pretexts for war they were going to create, that American intelligence has recovered its credibility. In other words, yes, do it only towards um, uh, adversaries. Otherwise, default position should be we maintain credibility, we maintain freedom of the press, uh, we try to convince our, our population and even our competitors with truth, not with falsehood. Thank you very much for holding up uh, such a strong statement on, th on the freedom of press, and this is also a very good, um, uh, yeah, very good uh, step into uh, towards our next guest um, and uh, uh, Ms. Caspar Claridge. So, what would you say from your standpoint as editor in chief uh, of Deutsche Welle? Where do you see your uh, responsibility um, from uh, from besides uh, the media uh, landscape um, to still yeah, having a voice, being heard, and also um, writing and uh, talking against um, false information, uh, misinformation, etc. Especially when we um, think in a context of um, yeah, where we are confronted with information warfare. What does that mean for um, um, for you as uh, as a uh, yeah, in the sector of uh, journalism, and media landscape, and uh, holding up? Um, uh, free speech and um, sticking to free press? 
Well, uh, it's our job is becoming more mm -hmm. and more difficult without mm -hmm. a question. We at Deutsche Welle, we have 32 languages. We broadcast in 32 languages. That means mm -hmm. you can, in theory at least, uh, receive our programs in Iran, mm -hmm. in China, in Russia, Ukraine anyway, and in many uh, other uh, uh, country, uh, countries. And of course, we also broadcast, whether it's on social media, or uh, online or on TV uh, in countries which are ruled by autocrats. And of course, they don't like what we are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't like it because we are trying to deliver facts and truth and to debunk uh, uh, false information. And uh, what we noticed is that we are under, under continuous attacks for example, everything with regards to uh, the war in Ukraine uh, by the Russians, uh, uh, our Latin American audience, when we publish something on our social media channels by our correspondents, uh, we get lots of comments by Russian trolls saying mm -hmm. this is a lie, this is not a war, uh, there are Nazis in Ukraine, and that was the reason, and so on. And the same is happening on our African channels, yeah? For example, in, in African languages, in Hausa, uh, for example, which can be uh, uh, understood in, in Nigeria, for example, the same is happening. So it's very difficult uh, for our, for my colleagues in the different departments to debunk and to, to differentiate and to find out what's, uh, what's correct, what's uh, not correct. Uh, and what we uh, tried at Deutsche Welle, we invested more and more in fact-checking and in certain software tools, of course, which can identify false information. And so thank you very much also for European support. I think it's very important. But you were saying that I think that over 2 million people had access to that page or 2.7, or, uh, or yeah. Uh, just imagine we at Deutsche Welle, we have every month uh, 1.4 billion users. Wow. So you can imagine in 32 uh, countries, but still, uh, so you can imagine how difficult uh, our job is. And what we try also with fact-checking is to explain to our users how to fact-check. Mm -hmm. We not just say this is right and this is wrong because of this and that, so that we describe our steps, how we found out mm -hmm. that this is wrong, what, for example, uh, Russia uh, published. And uh, then we are attacked again. And sometimes, I have to admit, it's very difficult for our colleagues because they are also attacked personally. They are identified. And uh, we just had a situation in Iraq, for example. We have a very famous presenter who is doing uh, programs in the Arabic language and who uh, talks about uh, taboo uh, topics as well. And he was supposed to do a an open forum in, in, in the capital of Iraq, together with a partner, Iraqi television. And uh, uh, Islamist uh, published that he is an advocate of LGBTQ rights and that he's uh, 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 publishing blasphemic uh, content and so on, regardless of what he personally thinks which was not the topic of the debate. But in the end, uh, we had to call in security and uh, had to get him and his team out of the country uh, because security situation was too difficult. Uh, we couldn't guarantee his safety. So you see how, how difficult this is. The same, I could give you examples over examples, situation uh, in um, Ethiopia, for example, for our colleagues and so on. Very, very difficult. But people who are working for Deutsche Welle, they don't see each other as part of a warfare. But they want to provide information that is correct, and that's what they are working for, and that's why we get many applications from all over the world from people who want to work for us, you know. Mm -hmm. So let us try to stick you to, to one of, to a no to the notion, which makes the discussion much more interesting, because you find uh, it's, not a, it's not a good tool to pursue our interests uh, other than our security, right? You would say yeah. you can be the honest soldier, but you would not engage actively in information warfare. Correct. All right, thank you. Correct. 
Okay, and uh, Dr. Katia Munoz, um, so you are um, looking at the topic um, from a slightly different um, standpoint. Uh, you're an expert in a think tank, also dealing with uh, yeah, new technologies and how AI can be used uh, in the terms of um, um, yeah, misinformation. Um, what's your perspective on it, and uh, how would you bes uh, prescribe um, what you're um, perceiving at the moment, especially with regards um, to um, the war from Russia towards Ukraine? And, and what has changed in that environment? Um, what have you perceived during the last year? No, what has changed? A lot has changed, but um, I just want to, buy, uh, if I thought that Mrs. Kaspar Klerich and Mr. Mm -hmm. Sikorsky really made some points on what are the real life implications of, for instance, mm -hmm. disinformation or some uh, tactics on cybersecurity. And that's really interesting because we're not only talking about something that happens online, it's something very real for people mm -hmm. offline as well. And I think that's something that everybody needs to be very aware mm -hmm. of. We're talking information warfare, mm -hmm. but it is about us because we're online. And that's also, I think, a good intro to my position. Um, information warfare is about people. It is about us. It is about everybody who is on the internet. And because it is about us, it is about our hearts and our minds. So I'm very principled on this, on this question, I would say. And I think it's very important to point out that this should also guide our approach towards it. Um, so, in this battle for our hearts and minds, I don't think it is worth losing this moral high ground that we have, if we have this position. And if we fight fire with fire and engage in these covert and deceitful um, influence operations that our adversaries are doing, what happens? This might include uh, spreading disinformation, this might include astroturfing, forcing engagement, um, by asking platforms. I mean, there's several things, non-exclusive, all in combination, we're talking strategies over here. Um, it's another level, it's, 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 it's very shady. I don't think we should stoop to this kind of level. But why? So I know that a lot of people in the national security establishment, they believe that fighting fire with fire is justified, especially in circumstances like this wartime. And I understand the reasoning, but I think the best argument against this notion would be that the, that the goal, if we, if we take Russia, we're singling out Russia, but the key objective here of Russia is, um, with its influence operations, is to attack the very idea of objective truth. What does that mean for us? It means they want to erode our trust, our trust in governments, our trust in institutions, our trust in the media, our trust in our communities, with families, whatever happens, so many polarized opinions, even people fighting within each other, not having the same opinion. So what actually is happening is that they want to create a sense of nihilism for their global audiences. And if we, as democracies, I don't want to say Western, because it kind of excludes a lot of other countries and regions that actually should work toward that actually have the same problems. So I would say if democracies copy these approaches, these techniques, we create conditions that are very favorable for Russia and that's China and, and maybe Iran, like, or maybe also non-state actors in the sense, um, they, they just create favorable conditions for these fabulous and, and, and even apologists that are amongst us, that we fight even within our country, without, within our demographics, we have people that are apologists of these people. Um, and it would be no upside, I think, for our free world. So how would I define this guiding principle then? Um, because I'm obviously a no, <laughs> in a sense, but how, what would I say is like the main headline that I would name it? I would say, if I want to win, if we would, if we want to win the hearts and minds of people, we should do it through radical transparency, and we have to adhere to the truth. And what does that mean? That means specifically to spread factual information and to advance democratic values and shape public opinion, but they have to have the choice to be able to shape their own opinion. They should not be just um, inundated by one source, in a sense, and that's what actually qualifies us also as democracies. That's our privilege. That's why we're sitting here and having different opinions, in a sense. Oh. Um, so, no, I'm not there. I'm not, I am not of the opinion that we should replicate this deceitful networks. We should, we should work towards exposing these networks. And I think Mr. I'm sorry, 
Car <laughs> Admiral Ile did a very fabulous job in, in listing the toolbox that we have at our disposal, in a sense, that we already have developed, and the need to these, uh, the, that these countermeasures um, are there and to know when and, and fast uh, to deploy them, in a sense. And uh, yeah, so how do we do this? How do we actually we expose them with radical trans uh, transparency, and then we can win this hearts and the hearts and minds of people with our super weapon, the truth. But now let's. I, I know it sounds very principled in a sense, but I want to make it very clear that I find that this um, that it doesn't mean that we need to share everything. This uh, tactic or the strategy in general can be very selective. And it doesn't mean that we are very passive either. We can be very assertive in defending our truth, let's say. You know? I, I thought um, I was reading about the what is it, the US Department of Defense, um, the doctrine that they follow for cybersecurity, they call it defend forward. And I thought it was very interesting, this concept. What if we apply it to information warfare? What if we defend forward and are very assertive? And I really like the example that you pointed out about the intelligence, the US intelligence, just before the Ukraine was invaded. What actually happened, I mean, it's a one-year anniversary almost, all these troops amassed at the border. And nobody was actually believing that they would enter that they would actually invade because it was I such did. an you did good Poland for you did. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> you were one of the few actually and and that's the point it was such an irrational idea for us to accept me as a western we me living in germany it was so, so irrational i just could not imagine and then what happened us intelligence did exactly what i said they were transparent about what they did they opened up they shared analysis, conclusions, they even shared the date, they shared data. I mean, nobody still believed, and even Zelensky was not believing these conclusions. And when Russia invaded Ukraine, I mean, it didn't really change anything, but what it did happen is that the trust that was, that this action actually gave us back. I mean, after Trump, there was a really big deterioration of trust that we had with the U.S. And I think this actually helped rebuild that trust that we had with the U.S. And it, is, it has also helped put us in a position where we are now. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you want to respond? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just want to emphasize because Russia is using trolls, of course, mm -hmm. and they are doing warfare. And that is so massive that it's sometimes difficult, you know, to come just with your objective facts and say, this is the truth. Yeah, because it sounds so more convincing the way they present it and the way they hide also that they are behind this kind of information which they spread. So these are really troll armies, one has to admit that, you know. So uh, sometimes I have to admit that we are too, too defensive. I don't say as journalists or are, 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 are not active enough, yeah? Uh, but uh, you, we had the discussion about uh, Russian TV, for example, it was mentioned as well, or uh, 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 the Russian outlets, we have roughly, we allow everything and they spread their misinformation and we don't have similar tools, at least not even for the, how can I say, more objective information. You know, so uh, we are always in a weaker position somehow. And, and that is a problem, one has to admit that. And also with the kind of software we have, <clears throat> you have to identify it quickly, for example. And not everybody is equipped uh, in, in Latvia or wherever, you know? I mean, trolls don't have human rights. <laughs> People have human rights. We are absolutely in our right yeah. to cut out trolls. Yeah, mm. yeah. Don't stop talking. So the best <laughs> moderation job in the world is when you don't have to say anything. I just make one little, uh, one little uh, announcement, and this is that you can already use either Slido to post your questions, because then we, can, we, have, a, we have a good, um, good, good amount of questions to ask, or then raise your hands. We will start with this in a minute, but I didn't, and we didn't want to interrupt your information flow, so please go ahead. 
Um, I, I would just like to, to answer to what you, what you were saying about trolls and, and all the industry that is behind it. Mm -hmm. I'm very aware of that. And it's mm -hmm. very, as I said, it's a machine, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not only by Russia. It's a lot of interest no, of behind not. there. Yeah. So, um, and that's why I was saying this is only a principle, guiding an approach. And the approach should include a lot of tools that we use. And these tools mm -hmm. should not mm -hmm. only be used by, I mean, media is an institution, mm -hmm. but it is only one piece of the whole, of you know? We have to need, we need to, do, I mean, there needs to be a national security uh, strategy that uh, includes countermeasures mm -hmm. specifically for um, actions that could be, uh, to, to, I don't know, classified as information warfare. There's so many things that need to be done, I mean, media literacy, but also capacity building. Exactly. What do you do if you have this link, if you don't even know that this link might be malicious, you know? So there's not only the media literacy, where can I actually get my, uh, my news, but also, oh my God, where do I click or where do I not click? You know, it's like the capacity building and the media literacy. And it's a holistic process. It's an integrated process. It should be international. And it should also be between ministries. There is no communication. I just want to, you know, like, one of my papers was just mentioned here. When I say um, how to plan and execute a coup, I thought it was very satiric because, in my opinion, um, if we take a click, we're looking at disinformation and the real life implications of disinformation, but um, I don't want to make the problem smaller, but that's, we only focus on harm reduction. We really need to take a step back and identify patterns and try to, mm -hmm. to understand how can we actually solve these problems? How can we circumvent? How can we actually find? The, or cut, as you said, reactionary. Where can we intervene to make the, the best, to have the best effect towards not um, mobilizing online violent insurgencies? And that's exactly the point where we need to work together. We need to establish more communication between policymakers and uh, decision makers, between journalists, and like oh, situational awareness is very big. Also, mm. you know, mm. yes. I think we, should, we need to be far more radical. We need to regulate the algorithms themselves. Mm -hmm. They are optimized to make money from making us angry at one another. Mm -hmm. And they should be optimized for uh, having a civilized discussion like this one. And um, this is very difficult because uh, we as legislators, our court system, don't have the expertise. We need help. Mm -hmm. But I believe it's one of those industries, like certain sectors in mining, where the regulators should actually be inside the company, because the algorithm changes all the time. Yeah. But the, the principle is that you know, trolling helps Elon Musk make, make money, and that's why it should be limited, and we could pass such a law. And, and you know, if they break the law, we, you know, companies do have uh, uh, physical locations and, and, and we can find them, or we can ban them, and we can only do it as the European Union. But, I mean, the audience, thank God for that, they know how to find information. I can give you an example. We are banned in Iran, in Farsi. You, in theory, you can't access our information. Fact is, 80 million people uh, per month do, mostly from Iran. They know how to, you know, use VPNs and whatever, and they want the uh, other part of the uh, other piece of the information, and so this you can find everywhere in the world. And so I think media literacy is a very important point, and explain how to use tools, especially for young people, of course, because they are faced with this masses on information, and it's very difficult yeah. to differentiate what's true yes. and what is a lie. I want to pick up what you said before. Um, uh, we have to be. We have to get better what we are doing, uh, and to promote what we are doing. And I, and I, this leads me to strategic communication, which is twofold. And I give you two examples. Um, some years ago, the European Union financed and built up um, a public school in a village in Serbia. But the strategic communication of the European Union. Yeah, was very bad. So after a while, the whole village in Serbia thought that the school was donated and financed by Russia, and they thanked Putin for it. So we were very bad. So first of all, we have to get better what we are doing. But strategic communication has also another, another side, that we have to find tools or ways how we can make our population resilient, that they can 
they, will, uh, that, that they can, you know, see what fake news are and what not, but this is an extremely difficult task. I can also give you here an example. It's, I think it's some months ago or a year ago, in world newspapers, um, for instance in the Le Guardian, you could find an article that Ukraine, that Ukraine would sell weapons to Syria and Iran delivered by Western countries uh, in their fight against Russia. Unbelievable, if somebody reads this in such a serious newspaper, I mean, what can he do? He, he, he believes it. So this is, this is a very, of course, it was a, it was a disinformation, and I don't know how the, how the Russian managed it, but it's, it was, you know, it was another uh, big disinformation campaign of Russia. Millions of people have read and, and doubt if the Ukrainians would use the weapons in the fight against Russia or sell it and make money out of it. But of course it was a fake news. But this um, uh, shows how, how difficult this task is to find ways and tools to make our population resilient. And these are the two sides of strategic communication. What we are doing and find ways and tools to make our population more resilient. All right, so thank you very much for this discussion already. I think we owe it to our um, viewers to take questions. There's a lot of questions online already, but I would like to give you who you know, came here the, the, first, the first round. I think we have microphones in the room. So if you would, yes, thank you very much. Then we would just start um, in the front row, with Natalia, and then work our way back, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for this amazing, insightful discussion. Um, my question is, since we're talking about alternative ways to combat um, fake news, since um, propaganda machines in Russia and other regimes have troll factories, wouldn't it be good to dis establish alternative uh, sites to, you know, media that we have, something like truth factories that engage, for example, with individuals such as influencers, for example, that are specifically um, trained to de deliver the news that are hard to come by and people don't trust from regular news sources to deliver to, for example, a younger audience through alternative sa channels such as TikTok, Instagram, and that are working closely, you know, with uh, information specialists to combat fake news that are, you know, being targeted by trolls, such as, as I said, as an alternative to regular media. Would you say that this is something that you could see doing? And what would you see uh, the, the pluses and the minuses of doing something like this? Thank you. Maybe I would love to hear the Deutsche Welle view on yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you why, because my, in my experience, yes. people love conspiracy theories. Exactly. That's what so I in my country, to say. in Poland, <laughs> one third of the population believes that the presidential plane that fell in Russia in 2010, I was supposed to be on it, uh, that it was an assassination. There is zero evidence for it. M mountains of evidence, including recordings from the cockpit. We know exactly you know, why the pilots made the errors that they did, yet uh, up to a third of the population at a certain moment believed that it was an assassination. President Obama, the Bertha conspiracy, uh, that he wasn't born in Hawaii, that he was born in Kenya and was a Muslim. Okay, never mind his birth certificate. You can arguably falsify that, but there was an entry in the local newspaper on the day of the birth of Obama, okay? <laughs> And still, something like a quarter of Americans believed that he wasn't really American. How do you deal with that? That's JK. what I wanted to say. Is the truth factory wouldn't work because what we think is truth and what we know is the truth, people in certain re uh, regions don't perceive as the truth. We have, for example, the problem in Africa where uh, Russia has a very good reputation uh, because it wasn't... Uh, 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 you know, it doesn't have the colonial history like uh, other countries. So um, when we talk about the Ukrainian war, by our correspondents who have spoken to eyewitness, who, who know what kind of atrocities oh, happened in Ukraine and report about it, we get uh, many, many comments saying, you are spreading lies. You are a troll factory kind of, you know? So um, it's not as easy as it may, may, may look, unfortunately. Yeah? But still, we are doing that, what you are saying, somehow. 
Okay, we have some more questions coming up from our audience. So many questions. So uh, <laughs> there was there was one here in uh, yeah that one. You were first, I think, and then we have Hello. some more. Uh, Hello, thank time. you so much for these consistent points of views that you shared with us. And even though I don't think that um, information warfare and Western states uh, can belong in the same 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 statement, because I think. Uh, it is inconsistent with the principle of pluralism if we engage in information warfare. I do think that us, the European Union, should do more to protect our citizens when we talk about clean networks. And speaking of clean networks, because you mentioned also the toolbox and the importance of having this common approach to re revisionist states, do you think that us, the democracies should do more to protect the citizens, the devices, the networks, and having a more uh, trustworthy approach when it comes to, let's say, 5G networks. Because we all know that in the European Union right now, there is, we are a bit far from reaching a consensus on this matter. Thank you. I think it's close to you. Yes, um, um, as I said, uh, a lot of initiatives have just started and they always say we have to give all uh, the success for these initiatives uh, a chance and they, and they are on a good way. And what you just said also mentioned to fight criminal networks, yes, this is really uh, 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 on the agenda. For instance, there's a close cooperation with Interpol and other actors no, to fight criminal networks in this regard. And. Uh, and I think, I personally think, yes, we have, of course, uh, to be honest, uh, in some uh, policy areas, there is not only unity uh, in the European Union. But although this is kind of natural, you have 27 member states and you not have every day a complete agreement of everything. So, and, and we have to find consensus and we did this. And for instance, the strategic compass, I mean, I can really encourage you to read it, it's only 40 pages. <laughs> and yeah, but this was also a compromise of member states no, to find an agreement here. Um, and I think, especially with regard uh, to um, uh, disinformation warfare, I think we have, we have, a, we have from my experience, uh, from my daily experience, we have uh, a huge unity in the European Union in Brussels, uh, be it in the Commission, be it in the External Action Service, in the European Council, and also in the European Parliament. Maximian, what does our um, participants uh, who are joining online actually say? Maybe we also have some questions. Yeah, they, they think it's here. a little bit too you know, aligned on the panel, so I think they, they want to have some short questions where are a bit more provocative. So the first, uh, I would say, goes to Katja uh, Munoz. Um, they say, what is Defend Forward? What is our truth? How can we define a truth? What is if this, com this truth concept of us is, is false? Um, and the second question would be to Mr. Sikorsky, um, saying, well, when you think about geopolitical issues like invasion in the Ukraine, is it a proxy war? Well, how, how, how much time and energy do you have to, 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 to take to make people really um, explain how geopolitics works? What's the interest? What is international law? What's, what is a rule-based order? What is a... What is, the, what is the value of international law versus somebody has given away to Ukraine, now they, they claim to take it back? So are there things in the world that become too complex to easily convey with facts, and that opens the door for it? Probably, uh, let's start with these two. Um, I think it's an interesting question. It's, it's a problem. Obviously, my truth will not be your truth. And I think it's very important. I think that's why I combine both concept, transparency and truth. If I voice my truth and I'm transparent about how I got to my truth, it would help you understand. And maybe you might not agree, but you know what I mean and how I came to that conclusion. And I think that should be enough in the sense even to agree or not to agree with that truth. But transparency, I, the combination is key because obviously, Everybody has a different opinion, and that's like a pri that's also the the benefit of living in a democratic space. That's why we should not, even if we don't agree with some people, we should not take away their voice. Even if I do not agree with the alternative for Germany, that you know, one of the parties here, I want, I do not want to restrict their voice, but I want to restrict to come back on the algorithms, the problem of virality of the algorithm that pushes these messages because engagement is important for them because of profit reasons and weakens our democracy. 
democracy. That's where I need to go. And not to silence specific voices or my truth is better than your truth. I think that's very important to highlight in this aspect. Thank you. <clears throat> I agree that um, geopolitical theories, international law, um, these are uh, issues on which you can have an honest difference of opinion. But war has a way of clarifying things. Um, the only forum in which I now debate Russian interlocutors is when I'm uh, invited uh, on, on um, chat shows by Al Jazeera. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 10 days ago, I was on, on a program with, with a Russian uh, legislator. And I mean, I'm democratically elected, he's appointed, but mm -hmm. let, let that be as it may. <laughs> and, and he was saying Ukraine started the war. And I thought um, that the best way to confront that was to appeal to the watching public to say, well, look, has a single Ukrainian missile hit a single Russian city? Has a single Ukrainian bomb hit a Russian city? Think about it in those terms, and you know what is the truth and what is a lie. And I hope I persuade so persuaded someone. Because it's Russian troops on Ukrainian territory, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. L let's finalize the round and then we can go to the uh, in-person uh, questions again. So one question for Admiral Ely would be, let's say uh, we, have, we see every day on the television, we see the reports of the advances on the battlefield. What if, the, what if some people would say, well, they ask me every day about the front lines. What if I try to keep up the morale by telling good things about the war. Is there a legitimate interest to probably protect people from dying, from keeping the, the armed forces in the Ukraine motivated? Would it be allowed to do that, or is that already untrue or potentially untrue? So in other words, do we have the responsibility to tell the truth even if we kill people, harm people, or make it harder for us to conduct warfare? Yes, I think it would be a big mistake uh, to keep the moral through false information. I think, especially when it comes to uh, you know uh, to uh, talk about uh, losses of human lives and so on, we have to be we have to be open and honest. Otherwise, uh, we would uh, you know you know trap into a field of disinformation, and we can be ex ex uh, ac uh, accused uh, of being uh, you know not honest. What we what we also uh, accuse uh, uh, Russia and China for. I think we should not do that. I, for me, for me, it's a clear no. Jennifer, we've waited quite a while, but now we have a <laughs> we have a, a disagreement here. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should be objective, but the Ukrainians are allowed to um, shape the information battle space because we now know empirically that when the news from Ukraine is good, Ukraine is winning, at least appears to be, support in the West for giving Ukraine more weapons increases, whereas when Ukraine has a reverse, it, which should be the other way around. But it isn't. Ukrainians are losing a third or a quarter of what the Russians are losing, mm -hmm. yet we hear less about it from the Ukrainian side. I think it's legitimate. Okay. I agree to you. I agree to you if I wasn't Ukrainian, but right. I, I understand right. how then we, as a European Union, should act. But for, from a Ukrainian standpoint, then we agree. I, to I totally agree to you. Okay. Ms. Castor, Clarity wanted to. Yes, <coughs> um, I've been to Ukraine uh, during the wartime and uh, I've spoken to my Ukrainian colleagues and they are very worried about press freedom in Ukraine. And they say we can't deliver certain information. We understand that we are at war, uh, but still we would like to report more freely and that's a problem. So we have to be honest about that also and we have to make clear that probably people in Ukraine don't get all the information which they should get. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's finish the round and then we go back to the people in person, the in-person questions. Two questions for Ms. Kaspar Klarich. So the first question would be, has the private industry which designs algorithms, Mr. Sikorsky, you have, you have already mentioned it, who decides who looks at what, making money out of it, uh, you know, keeping our dopamine levels intact in order to consume more, 
is this something that we need to regulate because it's a monopoly, it's an oligopolistic market? And what is the role, what could be the future role of uh, outlets like Deutsche Welle, where some people say, well, it might be financed from government budget, take Arte, take you know, certain outlets. And the second question to you is, it's the argument of the US free speech. If we take, take out trolls, like you have uh, proposed it, isn't this against the free speech? And isn't this already uh, you know, taking out some part of the competition for opinion? Okay, let me stay, uh, start with the end. Um, we could uh, make clear where the trolls are that would help already. We don't have to take them out but just identify them, so mm -hmm. that would help, yeah? And have the tools to identify them. With regards to Deutsche Welle, we are public broadcaster. Yes, we are financed by uh, the Kultur uh, Ministry, but they have no right, we have a Rundfunkrat and so on and so on aboard uh, to directly say what we are doing, otherwise we wouldn't find journalists working for us, and I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't work there. Uh, and what was the uh, first question was, uh, has the tech industry, the private industry become yes, too powerful? Uh, this is a huge problem, in my opinion, a huge problem. Uh, as you were mentioning, that certain algorithms are spreading or supporting uh, 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 certain opinions. Uh, the more radical, the more support, and the more money they make. It's absolutely and the crazier, true. Like the Vax crowd. Yeah. Exactly. I totally agree with you there. We need more regulation and we need uh, to have more of our own channels and not to be less uh, uh, reliant on Facebook, Twitter uh, or TikTok, uh, which is a problem because our users at the moment often are whether at TikTok or wherever, but not necessarily at ARD or Deutsche Welle channels. Yeah, that's a problem. So my regulation is needed to say, um, maybe also uh, more awareness for their own responsibility um, of the, pub of the um, private sector in that sense. And I would, I would just like else. to add something to this, because I think regulation is far too slow. It is there already. I mean, we have the Digital Services Act, and in the year it will be enforceable. <laughs> it is a big step forward. It still doesn't cover everything, but it is yeah. a big step. It yes. has the right tools within it. Yes. If you say people do not watch IRD and they're like public broadcasters anymore, and they will not go back, I can tell you that, because that's, that's a given. We say media literacy is for the young. I think media literacy is also very much so for older demographics, because they do not have the tech affinity. Younger people, yes, they might be influenced more, they might be radicalized, but they know when they see a fake. Yes. They identify that. Older people do not. So, um, because it's, it's just not something that they know. They haven't grown up with it, you know? So, um, also to come back to this influence, sorry, question that I think is very interesting and also important. You know, in politics, we are seeing right now politicians and even parties, including influencers in their digital, um, I mean, strategy. We see Biden inviting five TikTok stars together with 67 million fans to the White House just before the midterms, showing them around, answering questions, letting them meet Obama. You know, it was a star factor. So what happened? We don't know how much actually happened. Like, we don't know how many votes turned out, but what it did, it raised awareness to a specific segment. We don't, I mean, we, everybody speculated that there would be a red tsunami, but we know that it didn't happen. Why? Because younger people went out to vote. It's a big topic that I'm studying on, so yes, I can rant on forever, but I want to say that, yes, Deutsche Welle is very important, but it should also, um, we cannot, exclude social media because it is part of our lives. Oh. What we need to do, though, is regulate platforms because they're incentivized by maximum profit. Content moderation policies are only there to make us feel um, in Disneyland because if we feel too much rage, then we will not be there. So content moderation is there to maximize profit and not to protect us. That's why democracy is exactly right now weakening. So I think there's a lot that we need to do and accept and include social media influencers, not so much of educating them and letting them broadcast, but taking them in as press maybe, and just trying to explain when the Ukraine war started, the White House again invited a lot of TikTokers into their press room, and Jem Psaki sat there and just explained what happened, just facts. Just, you know, this is on that day, so many tanks, this army, so that they could, if they wanted to, it was not a must, 
If they wanted to, they knew the facts that they needed to project to their fans. If they wanted, no, none of them were political uh, influencers. All of them were just like whatever. They just want to, you know, have a no and then talk to their community because that's it. We're talking people that have 500,000 followers, interact with them several times a day. It's an emotional connection that they have. And it's very, very important to include them in trying to devise strategy in trying to understand how social media works and how the demographic that will come to power soon and is already in the process of will act. So no, no, I agree. We, we have to be there where our users are. That's what you mm -hmm. mean, of course. I didn't want to exclude and say we only use our own channels, mm. but we should support our own channels more, strengthen them, so that the content which is there, that people can access it easily and so on and find it attractive enough to also go to our own channels and not just to TikTok. But of course, Deutsche Welle is everywhere there. Mm. We are on TikTok, we, Facebook, you name it, we are there. Telegram, we've got, yeah. Of course. Okay, so as we want to uh, include you again, and we also have a second uh, voting coming up, and um, so we have one last question uh, we, uh, we can take, and I hope that you will continue your discussions uh, later on after the event. Um, so um, th there is one here in the middle. I think you've been raising you. your hand for a while. Um, oh, let's take. Yeah. I, th I think there's one gentleman in the front. He has like raised and Ted's take two very yeah, so quick and please go really short. Maybe we can really take um, both questions yeah. together yeah. and then um, yeah. giving your questions to yeah. the, um, to the panel. As quick as possible. Thank you so much and thank you for the great uh, the great discussion tonight. There's a lot of uh, different focuses that I'd like to bring up myself because I also study disinformation and, and uh, it's very important and there's a, it's very nuanced in uh, how psychology works. Um, but the the, the point I would like to raise to the panel is uh, there's, a, there's a big focus on FEMI and, and focusing on foreign, infl uh, foreign information manipulation and interference, uh, but there, it's also very important to keep in mind uh, the domestic actors that, that take place as well and those narratives and uh, actions that take place within our own borders and, and countries and environments. So when it comes to, uh, when it comes to those actors that disseminate uh, narratives that maybe have been influenced by outside actors, um, a lot of times we see that those people that are buying into those narratives are those that feel disenfranchised or left behind um, for historical reasons, for economic reasons. Um, so is it, my question to the panel would be, is it not also important to, for, um, rather than being uh, eminently reactive and defensive, which uh, you, you never really have a chance to control the battle space, if you will, um, but is it not also important to be proactive in creating narratives um, that people can buy into? Maybe not necessarily treating it like uh, warfare, where we manipulate our own citizens, but giving narratives and uh, identities, whether it's national or otherwise, for people to build reliable and trustworthy communities here at home that would make them more resilient to those outside nefarious narratives. Thank you. European Cosmopolitan. Um, I fully support the notion put forward by Mr. Sikorsky and other panelists of, uh, of uh, regulating the algorithms of social media and, and digital companies. Uh, however, I want to uh, pose a question about another conundrum, uh, another algorithm that we might have to perhaps look at changing, uh, and that is uh, the training of journalists and media professionals. Uh, because I uh, think that there is a very uh, big problem with false balance with always having to have someone from the other side uh, at the table, and, and then you get, you get punished with a vengeance when this gets compounded by pseudo-axioms like uh, where there's smoke, there's got to be fire, uh, the truth is in the middle, and so on. And how do we address this in the training of, of journalists and media professionals? Thank you. Thank you. And before you, you respond, just give me, give me one. 20 seconds to, to go into the, the questions again to just enrich it. So what we've heard here is, is really the issue. But one thing that, that has not come up here, which is really big in the social side, is what is if we have interests abroad and should we enforce them? Let's say we want to invest in China, we, we need resources from China. Should we sell the Af uh, from in Africa and should we t sell them our values, our narratives, our, our idea of how they should conduct business or not? Um, and I think with that, let's have a quick round for everyone, and then we go into the last round of voting, and we will have a very quick end, so we won't do a lot of talk, so let's take the, t the two more minutes for that. Thank you. If I may, uh, the, the, the first question, uh, yes, very good, very good question. Yes, uh, 
clear, this is a part of the strategic communication, to find narratives, to find ways, to find tools to make our citizens uh, more resilient. We have to do this without, without manu manipulating them. And uh, this is, a, this is a, the, you know, uh, the way we proceed currently to find these narratives and uh, to make our, resilient more, uh, our, our citizens more resilient against uh, disinformation. Well, as a journalist, I don't have a narrative, uh, and uh, I strive for multi-perspectives, and I want the audience to find out their own truths, and uh, I don't have a narrative, and I'm not taking part in any uh, type of warfare, certainly not. I think you probably do have some uh, categories through which you perceive the world. I think it was a German philosopher, Immanuel Kant, yeah. who... Um, of course, uh, we all have argued. our own cultural upbringing, yes, yes. yes. sure, but... Uh, and you, you perceive the world through those categories, but, but that's fine as long as you then apply professional principles exactly. to establish the truth. Exactly. And sometimes you probably need to declare your, um, your stand, yeah. so that's fine. Yeah. I agree uh, with the point about the educating of media outlets and journalists because there's so much unprofessionalism in this business, starting with the fact that we don't have a, a generally accepted uh, a def definition of a journalist. Anybody with a phone and, and, a, and a, uh, a portal can call himself a journalist and they are not responsible to anybody for the stuff they write. Mm -hmm. And you get some appalling uh, stories. You know, when I was minister, I went to one of the countries in Latin America, and I gave an interview to what seemed a legit, legit newspaper, and I read it the next day, and it's a complete invention. And our embassy says, don't worry, minister, nobody takes it seriously. They all do it. Hmm. Hmm. Um, uh, so, a lot of work here. And um, uh, let me just finish by saying that you in Germany should appreciate what you have. Mm -hmm. uh, the British still have strong public media, you have strong uh, private media, because you are a relatively big economy and your economy can sustain uh, uh, serious media, and even they, even in Germany, are in trouble, right? The smaller the country, the, the less resources for fact-checking and for, mm -hmm. for serious journalistic work. So I actually support um, initiatives in countries like um, Scandinavia and uh, Benelux, it started with book publishing. You know, because all these people speak English, they, 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 they publishers found that there was less and less market for books in Norwegian or in Swedish. So governments started supporting book publishing in those languages. But I think there is a case, it's difficult to, to do it well, but there's a case for some responsible uh, serious media to be subsidized in the role of guardians of quality and, and, and checkers of facts, because that's actually an important uh, public service that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise we are in danger of being, uh, of, 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 of sinking in a tsunami of fake news. Katja, do you want to have the pre-final word of the, of the round? Um, I, I can add to this. Uh, the journalism question is very interesting because now that everybody, that everybody has access to the internet and everybody, almost everybody has smartphones, we all become content creators, right? And we also can just post online and write stories. So it's a really big problem. And I, and I understand that we need to do something to not protect the profession, but to ensure quality. So how can you do that? Like right now, for instance, whenever a conspiracy theory comes up, even from a renowned journalist, as we've had by Nord Stream 2, I think, uh, I mean, everybody kind of knows about that, but um, he didn't get access to loyalty media, so he published on his Substack, mm -hmm. which is really interesting because, it, you know, a, li a lot of people use Substack, a lot of people use, or maybe not, but the point is it provides a platform for distribution, and because of the fact of virality algorithms platform, platforms, everybody has access to these. So, yes, it is a problem. I don't know how to really tackle it. It's not my field, but I would again say take away the, you know, like, uh, how do you say, throttle the virality 
um, make sure to identify sources, not journalists as such, but pillars of fact-checking. The other thing is with uh, disinformation in general, fact-checking most of the time doesn't even reach the same people. We know that, it's uh, several studies. So if we have this message going on on platforms 24 hours later, we come up with fact-checking and, and like all these, yeah, it didn't even reach the same people. And uh, it's interesting in the sense, so yes, it is necessary, but it's, it's very difficult to come up with a timely solution. So there, as I said, there's so many different problems to this whole thing. That's why I, I thought it was very interesting when you try to say information warfare. We say warfare because it's composed of strategies, it's composed of planning, and that's exactly what it is. We're having so many different points of entry, and we need to work on all of them. It's just an effort for a lot. It's, it's, the, it's the work of our society, you know, like to protect democracy. But that's the point, like we all need to work on it. Just a short word on Africa, because you mentioned it, no? that during the pandemic, uh, I very, very remember that uh, a huge part of Africans' population blamed the West uh, for having uh, introduced uh, the COVID-19 to the African continent, especially NATO and the European Union. Just like the Americans invented uh, um, uh, HIV virus. Exactly, so, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And of course, <laughs> we have to counteract it, but without imposing our will on the African countries, just as a short answer. That should be not our aim. Should we take the last round of voting? Yeah. Yes, so all right. Let's, uh, let's, see. Uh, let's see what comes up now. <laughs> all right, so and this time we have one question remains the same, to have the double blind element, so to say. And this is um, after the debate, would you now say that information warfare is a promising approach? We see that, let, let's give it for a second, and we use the time you make up your mind because we cannot leave, let Mr. Sikorsky go out without one more question. If you were to advise a person who is running in the autumn national elections in Poland on in digital information warfare, what would you advise him or her? Oh my God. Or him in this case? Um, well, our competitors, uh, we know, have recently um, taken to TikTok. And we are told uh, have invested a huge amount of money in, uh, in a, a social media offensive. Um, uh, and it's, it's very difficult. You know, Poland has the highest, uh, second highest inflation in Europe now. Um, last quarter, the biggest drop in GDP. Um, in real trouble with the European Union, we still haven't uh, had even our first tranche of the mm -hmm. of the recovery um, fund. Um, so I believe I think the opposition has a really good story to tell. Mm -hmm. um, but in previous elections, we have seen that completely fake news can be blown out of proportion and and affect the outcome. Mm -hmm. And remember. In, an in a general election, you don't need to swing your target by 30%. Okay. You Thank only you. need to swing it by 3%. Thank you. <laughs> because that's the difference between victory and defeat. <laughs> <laughs> like in the US. Okay, thank you very much. So, as we have the panelists need to take off early, I think we, we both would like to host them for longer. Probably we need to do it at a later stage. Um, and we have uh, additional events going on at the security main conference. The result is interesting because now more people say that they do not vote for this and they, they oppose it more strongly, albeit still less than 50%. I think the two of us would not have imagined that when we, when we thought about this. Thank you very much. There's a second question about whether you go offensive or defensive only. You can do it and you can see the results. Uh, to be true to the commitments of the other panelists, I think. Would you like to close the panel? <laughs> If he, exi if he exists, yes. <laughs> Thank you for that interve intervention. You cannot find the truth in, in Ukraine where there are baby factories. You cannot find the truth in Europe. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah I Thank think you we can much. have a whole panel on that question. Yeah. Uh, interesting question. God yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're very happy yeah. to take your question and to talk with you this after the event. But I think to be, uh, to be true to our panelists and their time commitments, we now would like yeah. to have an end. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much.
Well, all right. So yeah, let, let us thank uh, the panelists. Thank you. So thank you, thank you very much for this um, really interesting discussion to all of our panelists, and also thank you to our audience um, for um, discussing with us and uh, for well, being here with us today, and uh, wishing all of you a good thank time at the much. Munich Security Conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for participating. Very good.